listen, let talk a bit about the uh, travails of working with a silent partner. I mean, that that was a shtick that you guys came up with a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, I never came up with it. I never. I had nothing oh. to do with it. Uh, Teller was actually uh, uh, working silently before we met. Is that right? Uh, he was a uh, high school Latin teacher in Trenton, New Jersey, which is hell. And uh, <laughs> I'd be both Trenton, New Jersey, and being a Latin teacher in Trenton, New Jersey. <laughs> and he had worked his way through college um, doing magic at frat parties and had discovered that if he simply was quiet, people got sick of heckling him. Um, and so he was working silently, and the first gig I got him, I'm seven years younger than Teller, so I was 18 when I started working with him. Actually, I was still in high school, and he was teaching high school. Wow. Um, uh, we were two separate acts. You know, I did my thing, he did his thing. And then if we wanted to do something together, we had to keep the integrity of the solo acts. Yeah. So we never got, you know, I, I was talking to Tommy Smothers a lot about the idea oh, yeah. of one one of a team being silent. And I said, well, the problem with that is there never was the idea. You know, most of the stuff we do is uh, very premeditated, and we mm -hmm. usually have uh, uh, very pretentious BS answers to why we do it. But this particular <laughs> one, I think we have to go with chance. Is that right? Well, how perfect for magicians, <laughs> after all. And then so, now, I mentioned I think of your act as sort of a postmodernist magic. Was that part of his shtick, too, that you sort of revealed the... No, no, that wasn't okay. part of... So that really is your... Uh, well, it, it, it comes out of my... Uh, incredible uh, hatred and distrust of magicians. I mean, <laughs> and I don't mean that with any sort of uh, joke at all. Yeah. I mean, my feeling was the having an art form that uh, uh, that dealt with deception was not beautiful to me. You know, I was always a fan of people that tried to uh, cut through deception. I mean, my heroes were uh, Lenny Bruce, wow. you know, Mark Twain. Uh, my heroes were George Carlin. You know, my heroes were the Velvet Underground, Frank Zappa, Bob Dylan. Um, and uh, I didn't think that um, that anybody who was bragging about deception was someone interesting at all interesting to me. And then Teller had a kind of um, directness that I thought was kind of beautiful. And then yeah. we started out with this topic sentence of could we do a magic show and be honest? Now, obviously, I have to, uh, I have to uh, lie to accomplish the tricks, but I try to do what feels to me like a uh, like a different kind of lying that other magicians do. Uh -huh. uh, it feels to me different. It feels yeah. to me like there is a, a shell of honesty, uh, and that the audience is in on it. I mean, I never, I try to never lie unless the audience knows now he's lying. Whereas you'll find with other magicians. Uh, you know, uh, David Blaine is trying to convince you he really didn't eat. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there are people that are really starving. Why is why is that interesting? You know? So, are you on the outside of the camar you know, the camaraderie uh, of magicians? Not really. We simply okay. got old. I mean, uh, uh, we were outside of the camaraderie very, very much when we were under thirty. Uh, yeah. We were a whole different thing. But since then. Uh, you know, we have gotten to be more successful than our plan, which is another difference with is Houdini. Is that right? If you, talk to, if you talk to Houdini, he wasn't as famous as he should have been. Yeah. You talk to Howard Stern, he wasn't as famous. Tom Madonna wasn't as famous. Penn & Teller, much more famous than we planned, or should be. <laughs> you know, our plan, our plan was 200 to 300 people. Wow. And when we played the Paramount, we'd be playing 3,000. Yeah. So it's, you know, an order of magnitude more successful than we deserve, yeah. which is a good idea for a poster. Ben and Teller, <laughs> an order of magnitude more successful than they deserve. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that um, that with the success we've gotten, you know, having a theater in, in, uh, in Vegas called the Penn and Teller Theater, yeah. and having been, you know, Magicians of the Year, a zillion times and having people associate us with magic, I think it's kind of a losing battle to say we don't fit in yeah. to magic from either side. I mean, yeah. I would, I suppose I would like to say we're special and don't fit in the magic community, but I, I think that's a lie on the face. Well, because well, in some ways you've co-opted it. Yeah, exactly. And, you've and, you're and, now and, defining it. And it's it. co-opted us. I mean, both <laughs> well, at the same yeah. time. And uh, that's okay, you know. You mentioned Lenny Bruce very interestingly. I was wondering about, because now you are so, you, I mean, I saw you all the time in Politically Incorrect. You're frankly a regular on Fox News, it feels like, with your own show, Bullshit. I mean, you you are now as much known for your, 
don't know if it's political or cultural stance. Not, your I mean, not is the term you're going for. <laughs> My not opinions. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I mean, uh, how is that? Is that where, where your real, you know, heart and passion lies these days? And is that going to get in the way of your entertainment? Class? I don't know. It might. It might be. A, it might be a bad move. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And it's mostly because I don't have a business plan. I mean, if you yeah. if you walk into our offices, as hard as the hardworking people who work for us try, there isn't really a business plan. There's yeah. no. I mean, uh, uh, if you if you walk into uh, you know uh, whether it's you know Justin Bieber or Madonna, you know whatever generation you're talking about, they've got a plan. You know, then yeah. we'll move electric, <laughs> and then we'll play this side. You know, duh, duh, duh. and they know where they're going. Yeah. You know, uh I uh, I think naive people think think that people just do television because something's interesting to them, and they go on TV and they say what pops into their heads. That's not true. You have to be very naive and unsophisticated to believe that these people haven't got a plan. But yeah. then once in a while. There's a guy that's bouncing around that doesn't have a plan, and that's me. That's you. you know, that's I, great. I, they, I don't plan. You know, why Why on earth would you go on Glenn Beck and talk about nothing but atheism? First of all, anybody that's on your side is going to hate you for going on Glenn Beck. Yeah. Anyone that's listening to Glenn Beck is going to hate you for what you say. That is a perfect <laughs> lose-lose situation. It's only a nut who does not give a damn. So it's you know it's it's different from the uh, network thing. It's not here's a man who would not take it anymore. It's here's a man who does not care. <laughs> well, also, but, but that is your badge of authenticity. Well, I suppose. I mean, I, I suppose for those the consequences for those be damned. those who like it. And you know the consequences. Remember, you know we're not mining coal or going to Mars. The consequences for being incompetent are very minor. You know, people just say things in Twitter that are unpleasant. That's the that's the worst punishment you get there is no show business jail there is no explosion of methane that kills you and everyone you've ever met you can make gross mistakes you can make horrible incompetence and the and the and the what the worst thing that happens is you don't get asked on the show again it's not that terrible <laughs> i mean you dude, the worst thing i could do here is for you to go around the office afterwards and go well we're never playing that thing man he's such a dick that's 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 the worst, the worst. that can happen nobody dies <laughs> no one dies exactly <laughs> There is not a methane explosion, which is all I'm hoping for. If I can get through this interview without a methane explosion that kills all of us, I consider that successful. I'd love to talk to you all day, and I know you've got another show to do, but I want to get in this question. Your show is going to be near Christmas. Do, you have, do you have any particular take or stance toward Christmas in your show? Uh, no, you won't even know. We will be performing... As Christmas, if it was April. We will be performing Christmas Day in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. And there will be no way to tell. I mean, if you were to come come in from another planet and try to learn about the culture, you would in your essay that you turned in, you know, to Pluto, which is no longer a planet, please forgive me. Yeah. Uh, you would turn in and it would say, uh, uh, December twenty fifth is a random day in the United States of America. That's I just perfect. you know, I just kind of uh, pay no attention to it. I, I think it's uh, I mean I approve of People who say let's take the Christ out of Christmas, but uh, I'm not part of that, and I approve of the war on Christmas. Although I'm not a warrior, I don't even send really money to the troops. Um, I'm just kind of uh, indifferent. My children get a lot of presents on New Year's. Is that right? Yeah, we, oh, we start we start we start the year on New Year's. Oh, yeah, as long as you mention your children, I'm not prying, but. How are you as a dad? I don't know. I uh, All the MILFs at the school, and I guess calling them MILFs and to their face makes me less a good dad, but um, they all talk about how much time I spend with my children because I pick my children up at school, wow. and then I see them until 6 when I go to work. So yeah. other fathers see them in the evening, but I see my children, it's, it's a little... Yeah, so I, yeah. I try to spend, I don't know, I try to spend three three hours a day with wow. them and more on weekends and i enjoy them i mean i i got uh, my children uh, i'm a very old father uh -huh. my children are four and five uh -huh. and i really uh my children were not accidental i mean moxie my uh, oldest daughter is a test tube baby so you there's no way to pass that off as an accident yeah. you know there's a lot of premeditation and money yeah. involved so i i had my children in order to spend time with them there was no biological imperative it was strictly uh, entertainment and do you <laughs> 
<laughs> and do you do magic with them? Yes. Yeah. And, and I, you, if you would have asked me five years ago, will you do magic for your uh, for your children? I would have said, "Shut up, you're an idiot." That would have been my answer. And turns out I do. <laughs> I mean, I do a French drop, and and they say, you know, Daddy, make the salt disappear, and I do. <laughs> I, I do it all the time. I do it like that, you know, that unpleasant uncle who does magic. You know, for, I do it for my children, the and they and they the walk ear. around. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> and they walk around saying, you know, Daddy's magic. <laughs> okay. And I would have never. I mean, I am so so much too cool for that. But it <laughs> yeah. turns out I'm not. Turns out that's I'm right in the pocket, and I really do. Final question then. Shoot. Why Vegas? I think it's fascinating. When I first heard that, I thought, oh, that's such a great stunt because in a lot of ways you're sending up uh, magic, and now it seems like Vegas, yeah. you'd be sending up Vegas. Uh, it's, it's, it, was, it was an incredibly stupid, crazy idea. Uh, <laughs> when we were playing off-Broadway and Broadway in New York, and you're hanging out with all your hipster friends, <laughs> and we had hipster friends, I bet. and you say to your hipster friends, you know, we're going to go to Vegas and do a show, the reaction is kind of like, you're hanging out with fine artists and you go, I'm going to start doing exclusively paintings on velvet uh, with fluorescent paint and it's going to be exclusively Elvis and Jesus and they'll be crying and sweating respectively. That's my career from now on. And they look at you like, you know, puppies watching TV and, uh, and it's just an insane thing to do. And we came out and it turns out that, you know, it doesn't really matter very much where you're doing your show. Yeah. Uh, what matters is that people want to see you and you do a show that's from your heart. And I mean, Vegas has uh, more uh, terrible shows per capita than any other place on earth, but it also has more good shows per capita. Ah. It just has a lot of shows. Yeah. And, uh, and so there are shows that I'm ashamed to be in the same town with, <laughs> and there are shows that I'm proud to be in the same town yeah. with, and I believe that would be true almost anywhere. Yeah. Absolutely. And do you ever feel trapped there? I mean, obviously you get out and do shows elsewhere. But no, I really yeah. don't. You it's know, not the, a gilded the, cage. The, the nutty thing about Vegas is uh, we have more freedom creatively than we had on Broadway producing our own show with a contract that said we do whatever we want. We have more power in Vegas because they don't care. You know, they're worried about selling shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> and Sid Vicious slot machines. They don't care at all about us, so we do whatever we want. And we have uh, a wonderful crew, wonderful people that work with us, and we have uh, space. And we've put in more new material, you know, uh, since we've been over 50 years old. And since we've been in Vegas, we've done more material. I even got to say, and I, I guess whenever I hear this, uh, someone else say, I always believe it's a lie. But I think it's true in our case. We're doing nuttier stuff. Yeah, in Vegas uh, as as adults, than we did in New York as children, and wow. I th I think that's very rare. We do crazy stuff, and we do stuff in our show that absolute full out sucks because we're trying to do such crazy stuff. Wow. We pull it out and try again, but we are right yeah. on the edge. We are much braver. We care. Mu Another way to put that is we care much less. You know, when on Broadway, we we tried to be in our way. Yeah. We tried to be careful. Yeah. Now we just, uh, the audiences give us uh, enough rope and we use it to hang ourselves as often as we can. You clearly have as much energy as you probably did when you are in your 20s. Well, I also took a nap. If you didn't have oh, me at 6 a.m. when I first got up, I was also more tired. But I've had a nap and it turns out that sleep stuff, you know, a sleep and a trip to the honey hole, which is not usually the order it's done. It's usually done honey hole and then sleep very shortly after. But in this case, we did sleep and then honey hole. And uh, it turns out that gives you a little bit of energy. There you go. I'm just wondering, do you see yourself performing? You know, you mentioned Bob Dylan, one of your heroes. He's still on stage. I will, Is that going to uh, be you at 70 I, I, and I would like to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about how uh, Johnny Carson, you know, retired yeah. while he was still at the top of his game with dignity. Uh, I intend to not do that. <laughs> uh, I intend to be on stage long after I shouldn't be and long after it's embarrassing and I suck and I intend to uh, die in office. Uh, and the, the comparisons between me and Sinatra are, I think, will end there. They both went too long. That's all I want. The other comparisons, I think there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not fit to be compared to him in any other way except he went too long. And he also didn't try to kill a person with his bare knuckles. <laughs> Another difference between me and Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then that talent thing. Just one more thing. Anyway, that's great. I, I had a great uh, well, thank time. You. I, Lord, but I know you have a show right down the right Okay, down the I'll hall. go. I'll do whatever you want. He'd kill me if uh, I took you along. But it had fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. Nice talking with you.